five. And we have an unregistered delegation that is uh, Adam Daniel from the Cassette Pride joining us and he will be um, 4.16 and for 4.18 or sorry 4.19 4.9 Dwayne West will be replacing Gordon Scott and those are the changes I have is there any other changes then I have somebody Moved by uh, Director Lennox, seconded by Director uh, Brandon. All in favor? Looks like we have that as unanimous. <laughs> um, um, Director uh, Andrew Paul uh, is away with leave today, right? And as is Director Sandy McGrew. Where is she on with us? So I think my friend Chad indicated that she was going to be going to the chair, um, but I don't see her on the Um, direct, alternate director Garside is here, and alternate director Elliot. Okay, okay, those are the changes we have for her. Thank you and welcome. Um, that brings us to adoption of the minutes, which we don't have. Um, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Surprise. <laughs> I don't know, usually we do. So uh, that brings us to delegations. Each delegate will have five minutes and the clock will be on the screen and counts backwards while you're doing your, oh, 10? 10 minutes. What do I know? <laughs> 10 minutes, sorry. I was kind of, um, I'm not expecting to be chair today and I didn't do my homework. Um, and for the first item, 4.1, I sit on the board of the Power River Therapeutic Riding Association, so I'm in conflict for that, so I will be leaving for that very first delegation. Um, so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> All right, so um, as the chair and the vice chair are um, not in attendance. Can the assembly appoint um, an alternate chair for this item? We nominate Director Brander <laughs> for this little sure. spot here. Okay. Uh, it's it's yeah. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, as uh, the former chair who knows, doesn't sit in at finance committee meeting noted it's 10 minutes and of course we're going to be here for quite a while this afternoon a lot of delegates to get through so if everybody can wrap things up in a concise manner we'd really appreciate it the first one we have in front of us 4.1 nelly valentine paul river therapeutic riding association step on up you can sit or stand <laughs> thank you for coming and uh the floor is yours you I just wanted to come and say in person how much therapeutic writing appreciates the uh, support of that regional district um, monetarily and also that we feel so fortunate that we are located in Paradise Exhibition Park. We have this beautiful facility there that has been built with community money and we are able to provide therapy on horseback to um, people with disabilities in our organization. And one of the really nice things about it is that after the um, lessons that are given to these um, people from the age, we have preschoolers right up and people that are required, that they get to go outside in the fresh air amongst trees in a lovely little nature trail on horseback and have a lovely um, outdoor experience. And I, I'm not here, I just wanted to say thank you to, to you very much for everything that you have provided for us. So that's all I have to say. Great. Um, for yourself and for everybody else who is in attendance, the, the process for these delegations are that uh, the delegate presents, 
the directors get to ask questions if they want clarification or more information about the program. And um, when that's all wrapped up, it's done. It, it, it never turns into a back and forth debate or uh, conversation. It's more just questions for the delegates. And uh, that's what I'm gonna open it up for right now. Does anybody, any directors have questions for this delegate? Dr. Lennox. Uh, very familiar with your program, of course, you know that. I'm just wondering, historically, uh, is, is the program, the demand for your services growing steady, declining over time? You know, can, you know over the years, declining more demand or less? We have consistently, we do have wait lists for the program, especially with um, school children. Um, we, over the past four years or so, because of COVID, we've had to downscale a little bit because we needed to follow all of the COVID uh, directives about um, safe distancing and to keep everyone safe. But, and um, we did have, we had some staffing changes and that as with everybody in our community, we are in a position now where we have uh, really good staff on board and uh, hopefully we will be able to do more when we start up in September. Right. Do we have any other questions mm -hmm. from the delegate? Seeing none, I thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it back over to the Council Director Elliot. Thank you, Dr. Bradner. That brings us to 4.3. Susan McKay, Wild Ocean Whale Society. Come on, forward, Susan. Oh, no. Susan has a camera bill. I think she has a clicker. <laughs> sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. As you well know, um, the Wild Ocean Whale Society normally deals with whales, dolphins, and part of our mandate is to preserve life. So through our rescue and response program, we were called in to help out on Texada, which is why I'm right now with regards to the feral cat population and the problem of the exponential growth that happens with these cats. Um, initially, um, it, with a couple of people in Texada, the concern was the fact that um, a lot of people were saying that there, there was going to be some poisoning of these cows. And of course, preserving life, we went jumped in to help out. Initially, the uh, we took out twelve kittens out of the mix out of that colony. Where do I aim this? I'm actually not sure. The expert Need to be yeah, it's got to be closer to the people, I think. In any case, these 12 kittens that were pulled out um, of the mix were have been since adopted. Um, we were looking hopefully towards having uh, the SPCA take them on, get them into their, their adoption program and get them fostered out. Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen, so we wound up in our own fostering, and all 12 have been in the middle. That's what I'm trying to. That's <laughs> technology, we love it. There we go. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> So, um, so sorry. Um, 
Well, that'll do it. <laughs> as soon as I share, it doesn't seem to. Doesn't seem to work. Yes, I can. So yeah, just I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay, so these are the, the some of the kittens that were pulled out. Um, they were tiny. It was great. We got them. Our initial call in to uh, to help out. We thought was just going to be putting the SPCA together with the forensic data and getting the feral situation contained. Um, that did not happen. These are the feral cats that we counted. Our initial count was approximately 30 in one colony. Um, and they come out of the woods, basically. So um, we know that there is two major colonies there. Uh, of feral cats that um, that have been some people have been trying to feed them keep them contained. <laughs> the Salentian property ones are the ones that we have a great caretaker who is there. Um, this is where that is, which is why all the cats go there. The um, what we are doing is we are trapping getting them uh, over to home ox instead of the local vets because the local vets cannot handle it um, and can't handle the numbers that we're running for. So get them spayed and microchip so that we can track them if there's anything that happens. And um, we also have them ear tipped so that they are visually known as being already like the um, we did apply to the SPCA for a total of ten thousand dollars. We received; um, they granted us five thousand. We received twenty five hundred so far. We've already expended close to four hundred of that money, specifically the, what the SPCA covers, because they do not cover a lot of different things. Um, they cover the spaying, the neutering and they cover the microchip that goes into them. They do not cover the vaccinations. They don't cover any of the extra care. They don't cover transportation. They don't cover any of the extras, ancillary things that are necessary, any extra treatments. Yeah, if you could put it on the slide, please. Um, what did happen? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm crying here. <laughs> Esme's having fun with this yeah, one. Um, <laughs> and um, that's okay. Um, what we did have happen before we even got to the point of being able to apply to the SPCA for an endowment, we wound up with 17 cats that were poisoned and they were dumped in the Priest Lake watershed. Seda. We were fortunate enough, it was cold enough, it wasn't a huge amount of predation, but there were some of the cats that had been um, reactivity. Also, being able to get them out of that watershed area was huge. And it's thanks to some of our volunteers on Texada that we brought them over, got them uh, checked over, made sure that I uh, found out there were at least two that were already spayed and neutered, not through us, but through um, people who they could have been privately owned cats that we were around in. It's heartbreaking um, to see something like this. Some of the cats were from the one property in the one county. Some of the others we have never seen before, but we brought the one measured up. And please go ahead to the next slide instead yeah. of leaving the global slide up. Um, these are some of the ones that we've started with um, in April. We started with six at a time going in, spade, and um, basically TNR, which is trap. Once they are done, then there's less likely fights, less likely there's more likelihood of them being able to propagate. And, um, and they are in. They are continuing to be cared for by the caretaker. 
the SPCA is contributing um, some of the food that Caretaker is getting, which is great, so that uh, so that the cats won't starve. We can track of who they are, where they are. Unfortunately, there's a huge amount of construction going on behind um, that particular property at the moment, including trees being knocked down and everything else. So it, it's been a little bit difficult um, in making sure that the land is sort of uh, a little bit more contained. Out of the, um, to date, we have done 24 points statement. Uh, four of them only were done here in Powell River, working in conjunction with our local SPCA. Uh, we have been told that we cannot work through them. We have to work through this grant situation through the SPCA and put the bill to rest, which is why we were here. Um, these are some of the ones, some of the ones that we've been working in. Uh, to be spayed neutered. The, uh, our volunteers on Texada, it takes a couple of days to get these traps trapped. They have, we have a holding area. Um, Brenda has been instrumental, her and her partner. Uh, they built a holding area for the knots so that they're not going to be stuck in the places all the time while they're being held. Then uh, they, Start at five o'clock in the morning to catch the sixth rock ferry off of Texada in the Powell River. Powell River, 8 a.m., over the farms, get the animals in, stay neutered. We can't pick them up until five o'clock. We're on the seven o'clock back, and then the last ferry back over to Texada. So we're talking early morning, but um, volunteer efforts are absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm sorry. Your your time. I just wanted to give you a um, What I was going to say here is that um, we also have to cover any extra care these animals need, and these these guys have been um, access to that extra treatment as well. So please go ahead to the next one. And I thank you for your time, and I'm. Thank you so much, Susan. I also want to welcome uh, Director McCormick, as I noticed she's joining us. And I'll open the floor to directors who have questions of Susan. I know Director McCormick has one. I'll go after her. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead, Director McCormick. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Susan. We totally appreciate what you're doing. I think it's truly awesome, and I'm glad that you're able and have the capacity within um, Wild Ocean Whales to be able to do this. So my question is, um, do you anticipate uh, sort of an end date when the um, the feral population will have been dealt with and that this will no longer be an ongoing problem? We've had um, a number of the females that were, that were spayed pregnant. Um, we know that there is uh, the last one that was spayed had already given birth and her milk was drying up. So we know this is an ongoing situation. Um, it was a short term project in my mind originally. It, it has become an initiative that I'm not certain. Um, there may be some ongoing work that we can do locally, but for the moment to really knock it down and get that population down. I, I wish I could say that next month. Thank you. Uh, Director Lennox. Yeah, I, I see in your in your submission and through your discussion that SC, SBCA has been involved, obviously, but what about BCSPCA? So that is BCS. So that's who you're trying to work with? We are. With the local. I have been working with the local office with the regional manager and with the um, and with the so they only pay for certain actions. Yes. Thank you. Do we have any other directors that have questions? Director. Yes, sorry. Go ahead, Director. Our, our side. <laughs> 
<clears throat> Hello, I, I, I would like to say that I really, really appreciate the work that this group is doing, but my question is a procedural question, so um, it doesn't actually affect uh, this particular presenter, but I, I love the work that you're doing and I think it's really important, so I would like to say that. Um, my question is for Michelle. We have um, a presenter, Dana Lepofsky, who is on a time schedule that may not permit her giving her presentation. Uh, she was advised to show up for 1 p.m. and didn't realize that there would be a long queue and needs to leave around 2 p.m. And I'm not sure if we can rearrange so that we get to hear her presentation today. So I'm just putting that out there. Thank you. So um, I'm going to leave that with our, um, our <laughs> CAO at the moment. And I'm going to make sure that we finished off the questions for Susan and we'll come back to that answer. Uh, any other directors have questions for uh, I, I have one question. So just for clarity, you're applying for funding from the QRD and what was the amount you were hoping for? We never, we never modified the amount um, because we have been working on bottle drives and donations have been coming in that are again restricted to only this. Okay. So um, it's this is the first intake. The next go around, we'll know if there's going to be a little bit more that we need. Okay, I think Director um, Grounder had an answer. And the, yeah, the, uh, in the submission application, it says 4,390. Okay, thank you. I, I was seeing the total in my in the, Thank you so much, Susan. Thanks. Thanks. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have an answer for? Oh, I guess that's. Well, can you answer the one? I may chair. It would be up to the membership if they want to reorder the agenda if they um if everyone agrees to reorder the agenda. And I think that would be item four ten. So um first of all I'll ask the directors uh item four ten if if we would like to uh move it to uh an earlier spot on the agenda. Is there anyone present in the directors that have any comments? Mm -hmm. By unanimous consent, I would ask to move that 4.10 to 4.4. 4. Uh, and then bump to the rest of the board. And do I have consent for that? And seeing anyone's? Yeah. Okay. So then I would call uh, next delegation 4.10, Dana Lafalki and Kaya Fraser from the Whiskey Community Association. Thank you so much for accommodating me. I have a meeting with students after, and I didn't realize that I'm so, so sorry. I appreciate it. Um, I'll also hear with my one of the team members, um, Kaya Fraser, also from the Hoyate Project, and I'm here on behalf of the Hoyate Liskidi Lis Archaeology Project and the Liskidi um, Community Association. And I'm going to quickly share a screen. Um, tell me when you can see it. Mm -hmm. You're good. Okay, good. Um, so. If I can get into video mode, if I can figure it out, I do this 20 times a day, I should be able to figure it out. Okay, so um, the title of our project, Layered Histories, it's about um, putting together a, an archival database that honors um, the indigenous and the settler history of the island. It's focused on Hoyate or the Skidi Island, as you guys know, is in the middle of the strait, in the middle of everywhere. That's um, has been so for, thousands of years and it is so today in that 13 nations have um, historical connections in and the settler community is quite diverse and it's really a really good place to be doing kind of example exemplary dives into how to 
honor and respect indigenous heritage as well as settler heritage. So it comes from the place where I believe that archaeology is can be the beginning of conversations and we can draw people in, but through archaeology and in, in that way, um, get people talking who might not be talking um, at other times. And I could tell you about the kind of things the larger project is doing, but I want to focus specifically on the, the funding for this project. Um, this is just an example, again, of the, the archaeology and the other kinds of data points that we have. And really, this is all about, again, honoring heritage um, of Indigenous people and other peoples and countering the whole idea of erasure, that Indigenous peoples were never on the island. Um, and this are the archaeological sites that we documented. And you can see that they were everywhere. And the Skidi is not going to be unique. It's going to be the same. I've worked in Powell River for many, many years with the Tlaman. It's the same everywhere. But it's, again, just using this place as, as a test case to make people understand the complexity of, of, of heritage. So this project, however, specifically, is to complement the archaeology by documenting other kinds of, of heritage and what I'm calling ecocultural heritage or the ecocultural landscape. And that means documenting the archaeological sites, but also the streams that held salmon in the past but don't today, the culturally valued plants like camas and um, and uh, um, crab apples, and various kinds of changes to the landscape because in my experience, what people see in the landscape today is what they believe always was. So if you really want to contribute to countering erasure of indigenous history and even early settler history, you need to actually help people understand that the landscape used to be different. And that's one of the things we're trying to do in this project here. Um, through interviews, field visits, um, deep dive into archival documents and archival photos, I'll show you some of them we've come up with air photo analyses from the 1930s to look at where was the where were the forests, what were they like around ancient indigenous settlements, how did they get cleared, how has our landscape changed, and just to get people to understand that heritage means looking beyond what we see around us. It also involves field ground truthing of some of these ecocultural features like all the streams that used to be salmon bearing and the like, and Kaya is going to play a big role on that with her GIS expertise. And then we're collating all this in an accessible uh, database or archive for the community so they can see the, compil the compilation of these different kinds of knowledges and histories that's place-based and layered through time. So here you can see just kind of thinking about some of the information that we are gathering, the archival data, this map from the 1890s that shows where the springs are that aren't there anymore, that allowed people to live here, the streams that used to be salmon bearing no longer, we're interviewing some of our longtime residents, um, settler residents who have been here 50 years and even they have something to add to kind of this idea about change. This is False Bay, which you all guys, you know well, we know from reading journals, it was actually, it was a huge midden, hardly anything left today. In the 40s, uh, the, the, the midden was carted away, including the ancestral remains to pave the roads of the Skeedy. So these are the kinds of things we're finding out and um, help to educate people with. Also mapping these um, managed ecosystems, which are just legacy ecosystems today, but again, are part of this landscape that we want people to think about in this layered history. All this goes to countering the idea of erasure. You know, we look at these sites, we know that they're huge, and we can find out what they were like in the 40s. We can compare the photos from the 40s to today and say, okay, where what's happened to this history? Because we hear, of course, a lot of people saying things like First Nations people never lived here. They came here just to dig clams. Um, where are the longhouses? Where are the structures that people would have needed to survive the winter? So these are the kinds of kind of um, ideas that we hope to counter with, this, with the larger project and in particular the one that we're seeking funds for here. A big part of the funds that we requested for is to put together this archive. And this is a database that uh, we created with Gitgat Nation um, that actually is a place-based archive. And I just had a long meeting with Tlaman this morning about kind of the cultural protocols that we have in place to protect information that shouldn't be shared publicly, but it's to bring all this information together. And we can do it by place, just by click place. These are some of the places. Again, this is Hartley Bay, Gitgat territory, but you can click on one of these places. You can see a map. You can see the data that are connected to it. You can see videos associated with it, interviews and the like. And we got 
access to this, this structure for this database for free. So now we just need to pay a developer to actually change it and make it Lascivia friendly, which is really something special because we spent like $50,000 on making this. So why is this important? Well, it's important because I believe that protecting heritage, and I mean anybody's heritage is fundamental to people's well-being, settler and indigenous alike. I believe that um, really this is a way of honoring indigenous and settler heritage and recognizing that there is this layered history that is what you see today is not how it always was um, and it's important for us to remember that i think we're breaking down the barriers of fear that other people have about someone's heritage if you recognize someone else's heritage it means i'm losing my own we've heard that from people we're trying to break down all those boundaries and I also say, I would argue that this kind of project, which can be a model for place, other places in the region and beyond, is a model um, for kind of a small baby step to down the path of reconciliation, which does, as we know, is a very complex and long road, but this is one small start to it. So thank you again for letting me go now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll open the floor to directors that may have uh, questions, and um, we'll start with Director Brandner. Uh, thanks very much for presenting to us today. I was kind of curious, I was looking at your budget, and I was wondering where you came, I guess I'm, I was a little bit surprised at the cost of some of the, the line items, um, looking at outreach, report writing, digital archive support. There's 120 total hours there coming in at $150 per hour. It just seems pretty. That was, nice. yeah, so that's in kind support. I, I have to say, I'm sorry, you guys. I've, I've done quite a few budgets in my life, and I was confused by the the, the plus minus sides of your, of your format. So I'm sorry if we screwed it up. I tried the best I could. That was in kind support. That's actually coming from the director of the, of the White Museum. If you know uh, the White Museum in Banff, and she used to be the director of the, uh, of the Glenbow Museum in Calgary. And she is a settler um, ancestry here in Laskidi. So she's gonna play a big role in helping us with data security and data sovereignty. She's not charging anything. It's all, that's just what she would charge out so I'm sorry if I filled it out wrong. I feel like an idiot, but I just didn't know. Anyway, that's why that that's why that's that's such a big number. But her her expertise, because she is the person, like this is what she does at the Glembo all the time with indigenous communities. So it's pretty neat. Okay, thank you. Um, Director yeah, your question. Go ahead, Dr. Director Garside. I didn't actually, that was actually a reaction to the presentation. I had my thumb up, not my hand raised. So oh, that's why it disappeared. Right. So, yeah. But thank I you. I didn't know if you were trying to be speaking or not. Uh, any yeah. other directors have thank questions? Thank you for asking. Uh, seeing no other questions, I will thank the delegate very much. And we will move to the old 4.4, which is now 4.4. And ask uh, Siobhan Brown from the Consent Community Justice Society program. Oh, and Chelsea Friedman. No. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Siobhan. I'm the manager for Gothic Community Justice. And I'm here with uh, Chelsea, who runs our Youth Restorative Action Program. Um, I apologize for the last minute materials, um, but I did, I was hoping to have our annual report ready for you, but I didn't quite get there. So we got just a little excerpt of some numbers that we thought might be uh, interesting and useful to you. Um, I thought we would just talk a little bit about restorative justice and what our program is, and how it's going to talk about the program, and then we can um, So for those of you who don't know, um, that community justice uh, offers restorative justice services to this region. Um, those can be criminal or non-criminal, and essentially what restorative justice means um, is that the people who are directly involved in the conflict or the crime uh, come together and have a facilitated dialogue and that dialogue takes place in a circle um, and we have volunteers that run those threads. Um, so we get the referral from 
either our CMP or our Crown Council and our Central Bureaus or other organizations in the community. Uh, we will do a suitability screening to make sure that everyone understands restorative justice and what is expected of them. Uh, and that there are no safety concerns uh, for us as a case team moving forward. Uh, then we will appoint a case team of volunteers and they will move forward with prep sessions. So asking questions like, you know, what happened? How did you get interrupted? And what would you like to see happen next? And then once everyone feels prepared, uh, we get into a larger circle with everyone who is involved and talk about some of those impacts and, uh, and come to a consensus about what the next steps are to heal some of the harm that has happened. Uh, sometimes this comes with a resolution agreement uh, where certain people agree to um, actions to try and repair the harm that they have caused. And then we will also monitor that agreement to make sure that it is completed or to support people. Um, yeah, so uh, reports wise, um, our referrals increased significantly from last year. Uh, so we had 18 referrals this year and we had seven last year. Um, and our budget, um, there was also a significant difference from last year to the year before. So last year, our budget was around 111,000 and we ran a deficit of 10,000. Uh, the year prior to that, our budget was uh, 230. So the 200,000 is the mark that we need to be at to be able to provide both our core services and our youth services. Um, yeah. So over the past few years, we've just been building the foundation of the program. Um, it's youth-led and primarily looking at growth. Um, so we've been focusing on education and workshops, so the youth kind of design what they want to teach around restorative approaches and using circles. Um, so we do it, we present to students and grades, and then also teachers at Point um, Yeah, that's just a, for me, it was just um, teaching the teachers on how to use circles in their classroom for learning. Um, we also do circle dialogues. Um, so this is also run by the youth, run by the youth. Um, and it just, it, the purpose is community building outside of the community and also with groups. Um, and the idea is just it gives everyone space to voice their thoughts and their feelings, experiences on a specific topic, which then like mental health and some future relationships. Um, so yeah, it just really helps um, build relationships with others. And then we just finished training. Um, so we trained six youth in 2022 on basic art approaches and how to observe service. Um, as we head along, and then now we're strategizing and recruiting for new case workers from um, 15 to 27. Um, we're hoping for a team of about five to seven, and they'll do uh, a big full case worker training um, at the end of July. And then they'll be mentored by either me and George Siobhan um, for different cases. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, the youth program has been going amazing and our kind of exciting news is that uh, we have got a federal um, grant to work more specifically on external case workers. Um, so the way that it works right now is that whenever we get a referral that involves youth, we try and have at least one youth case worker. Um, and we're hoping to kind of flip that ratio so that it, youth cases would be primarily facilitated by youth and then supervised by an adult. So with that federal funding, um, it means that our um, office rent um, is now covered. So our original ask of the QRD was to get our rent and our utilities and office supplies covered. So we've revised the ask now to $2,000 for our office supplies. We don't anymore. <laughs> Not this year, anyway. <laughs> Good. Any Thank you. Um, that was wonderful. Um, so I'll open the floor to directors who have questions. And Ms. Wachowski, you could just turn your camera off until maybe questions might involve you again. Thank you. Um, Director Lennox. Yeah, we've heard a lot in the news lately about uh, federal uh, proposed legislation and uh, you know, bail reform and all these things. Um, is there, you know, I'm reading your submission on how you measure success and 
that's probably a longer term um, viewpoint on recidivism and, and repeat offenders and how the youth end of it is either part of that or not. So I'm just interested if you have any awareness of that or, or tracking that. Yeah, I'm, I would definitely like to get a better tracking system in place for young recidivism. The issue obviously is like privacy and working something out or if there is something to work out with the RCMP mm -hmm. um, or her found to get access to those files. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, obviously we certainly track participants that are involved in our own program. Um, and it's mainly, it's mainly qualitative for you right now. So, you know, measuring how they felt before the experience, afterwards, um, to, you know, do the victims of their crime feel better than they did before, and do they think that they will be able to be offended. Just maybe a follow up to that. I see it your your self referrals. Those are people basically volunteering to be part of this. Yeah, how it works. Those are high, which is great. Yeah. And your referrals from RCMP and Crown are about seven of the eighteen. So maybe some more opportunity for use of this program through those services. For sure. Department. Yeah, so we just got our memorandum of understanding with Crown in this year. Um, so, yeah, I think it was in September. So, um, we weren't able to accept Crown, but we can now. And yeah, sense. thank you. <laughs> yeah, they've been really supportive. For your doubt, just a couple of comments. First, I really support what you're doing and what you're trying to do. I agree with. You. That area A that uh, we need to have a closer relationship with the PMP and also to move things away from the justice system where it's possible to find a solution as opposed to jail time. Everybody, everybody better. It's this opportunity to say thank you for actually filling out the application for. <laughs> the application form full of important information that the board is going to use when we try to prioritize all the applications we get. Help us out by filling your form in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to say <laughs> you know, it sounds like we are building amazing little facilitators, or, or maybe not little, but yeah, we need <laughs> facilitators in our community. And so I see that um, transferring into um, an increased capacity within the community to do continued work. And um, I'm so supportive of that. And thank you so much. Is there um, the intention for some of the facilitator people that are training as youth to continue on their work in the as they go through. Yeah, that's that's the hope. Um, we're we're really blessed with our volunteers and you know our adult and our youth volunteers put hours and hours and hours of time in. Um, obviously, as a program, there is no shortage of work to be done. We could certainly use more staff. Um, and yeah working towards kind of increasing our capacity, expanding our programming, um, and working with you in any way. So that's my follow-up question then is, are we at capacity for the cases you can handle at this point? And you're, you're mapping them based on capacity or do we have more room right now? And, and uh, how is that going? Um, at this point, we have not like, the suitability, people have not been turned away because we're at capacity. So the suitability is more about safety um, and if the participants are actually a good fit for restorative justice, i.e. they're really taking accountability. So at this point, I think we still have the capacity to be accepting more cases, um, but certainly, you know, with the new Crone MOU um, and the RCMP remains supportive, I can see a very big jump coming soon. It will certainly need at least one more staff member. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. I, uh, uh, oh, Director Verified. 
Thank you. I just wanted to thank the delegation and to thank you both for the incredible work you're doing. The community building and potential is just the surface of which is just being scratched. I see this as community building, but also community health building in a much broader. And I think the more that we can integrate this into all of our communities, the healthier and uh, more balanced they will be and the bigger potential we have for, as one of the directors said, healing as opposed to jail. I'm not sure if he used healing, but I'm using that word because it is about community healing. And so often the perpetrators of the crimes are also suffering perpetration and are doing their own healing from trauma and many other things. So I, I thank you and applaud you for that. All right, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the old 4.5, which is now 4.6. Claudia Medina and Bruce. Bruce not working very Lorenza Kaint, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Art regarding financial assessment. Welcome. We have another chair if you want to sit. It's Dan. Sorry, David. Um, so, yeah, we're very happy to be able to join here and share some information on behalf of the Art Society. My name is Claudia Medina, and I have been a part in some form with the Cathet Art since 2018 conception of the art space. And I am an artist and a, a member and a parent, so I play in all the various capacities of the art center and all the other things that we do. Um, the, one of the reasons that we're here is to um, also to be able to be very thankful for the support that uh, the people have given for previous um, programming. We're very thankful for that. Um, and to be able to actually give uh, an update of all the amazing things that we've done for the last few years. Um, one of the amazing aspects of the art is that since its reception, it's uh, been able to share uh, art forms in various ways. It's the first time there's been a, a public art space that has had the capacity to be able to show local and non local artists. Uh, that have uh, been able to present in many forms um, from the traditional different uh, forms, forms of art making that many people are, are familiar with to a large, wide variety of modern media. There's been um, installations that have involved video art, there's been uh, sound art, there's been experimental sound uh, performances, there's been uh, a lot of different uh, engagements, possibilities that have happened laid out in the space as well. So. It's opened up a lot of um, doors in terms of being able to give people the capacity to share their work and also people to access work. And, and if they can, and one of the exciting things that I've seen happen is the youth and child involvement. As a parent, I've had my child go through uh, some of the programming where not only have they been given instruction by amazing people, but they've also been able to show their work in a professional context. And not only that, be um, given the skills to share their work and present it to other people and to actually have um, you know, the ability to start to look at other work and, and give positive perspective feedback. And I think that's something that's you know, it can attach itself to many things, not just the arts itself. Um, in terms of community development, I've seen so many amazing things happen with um, community groups that have come to work and, and share the space in different mm -hmm. ways. I've seen amazing offsite um, uh, events that have happened. I've been involved in, in uh, collaboration with a, a number of different groups in the community where we do a uh, kind of rooted in some of the day of the dead traditions, but we do a community kind of like a gathering where we do offsite or onsite as well. Where people come to share their uh, stories about grief and, and also acknowledging death and forms. And, and so it's become this sort of catch, um, catch point for people to come and share uh, stories through an artistic kind of lens as well, or share their own work as well in that context. Uh, the show that's currently on right now has had uh, one of the um, 
the fallout came, I think it was 70 submissions that came out, and, and the level of work that's being shown in that space for young artists is really quite exceptional. It's really exciting to see that there's an opportunity for them in that way where um, they're inspired and inspiring and uh, the level just keeps increasing. Yeah, so I, I find it very exciting and it's great that um, And then on the level of um, just the uh, capacity building that's been happening in terms of this year being able to uh, incorporate uh, new folks coming in to learn skills around administration. Uh, we have a young person, Ethan, uh, who's been mentored by Karen uh, at the Center to uh, work in, in some of the learning capacity to become an arts administrator, which is a really amazing opportunity and to make that exciting. Like um, and so there's just so many things that's been happening at the Art Center. Um, we're having a public art space that's been very much um, generating a lot of development and also creative uh, capacity. We're going to be having um, a show in the fall that's going to be uh, highlighting some of the very well known artists in the wild and sometimes we have a show at the gallery. Um, it's fish and it's a multimedia space. And it's, which having a space like this creates a capacity to show great art. And it's an amazing show. So to be able to actually have that here and have that level of, of show and installation is really exciting. And it's also creating relationships with other art centers from the uh, Art Gallery to Kendall River. We've had connections with down the coast with the child. So it creates a circle that we keep building on and building on. In many ways, that's also part of the creative economy um, conventions that I was a part of a while ago in terms of developing plan or ideas around how our communities and regions can develop as a creative economy as well and a climate community. So, um, yeah, so we're very grateful to be here and thankful and have some support for us. Thanks. Hi, I'm Lisa um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my experience as an artist. Um, and then I came to move here. I uh, wanted to be involved in the arts community, so I was wondering where I could go. And I landed at the Art Center. I moved to the Art Center, and I have been able to teach um, drawing, painting to youth, a very diverse. Um, number of ages of people um, in the community. So bringing people together and getting people to talk about art and to learn about how to see and how to engage uh, with the wide world. And um, I'm also a part of the Catholic Art Studio Tour, which am, I live north of town and there are um, I think more than half the people that are involved on the studio tour, there are a lot of artists. So um, I was surprised at um, the um, engagement. Um, there were probably over close to 100 people that came to my studio and um, asking me about the community, asking me about um, where to go to eat, uh, about Powell River, about Kempet. Um, and, um, you know, I had people from New York, I had people from Americans, I had locals, it was a very big range, and I just felt it was a really great community event. Um, um, yeah, I came from Vancouver, and that's yeah, Parker Street, it just grew and grew and grew, and it, you know, brought in a lot of tourism. That was great. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's kind of, I think, Mostly what I want to say, they also have uh, been involved in the art camps, um, which have been really a delight. Uh, a lot of youth and just seeing the way that they um, making, learning, interacting, socializing. It's just such a great community building, community active arts. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do we have questions from directors at this time? Seeing none, I have a question. 
<laughs> so um, the regional district uh, supported um, for the first time a grant to the art center, and um, can you comment on how that helped with leveraging outside dollars for our community? Come on, come on up, Karen. <laughs> the this is the arts and This is the part I love to hear about. <laughs> so um, the funding that we received the last time, I think that is really helpful because we just received our first federal grant. So, and it was very specifically for the Fifty Bay for the Canada Summer Jobs Program. So this is really cool. Um, we can this in an area and, and jump and um Ethan was one of the founders of the youth art show so it's just a really outstanding way for um sd47 supported the outreach so because it was student driven and there was a place to go we were able to train the students in how to have an arts call how to install a show how to host a show so meeting in events coordination, um, those skills are just they go on and on and on. And so these are these are really important things for them to have on their resumes as they gain the time to work their way into their careers. They're amazing community building opportunities as well. So that support directly from the regional district from support. So we've been doing really quite well. Um, and the BC Arts Council told us originally, we had to have a facility for two mm -hmm. years before we were able to apply for operational. Mm -hmm. So we had to go through volunteer hours. I would say the calculations right around 250 to $300,000 of volunteer hours before we were able to eligibility apply for a professional payment. So, Getting through that was just really significant to see how much the community got in having that opportunity. So, in, in just building relationships, one of the other opportunities is with the piloting artists and residents. So, we have a relationship now with the public library. The public library now has an exhibition space and the current artist is playing with these. So that's been really amazing for the youth to be able to go to programming, to go also see a professional artist who their job is making art. And that there's that future without all of these foundational opportunities to use the academy and the arts society and we can't the art forms and the arts and we have all these great opportunities. And so what we're able to do with the art center as a fund for the region is help build up. So mm -hmm. artists like Claudia and Lorenza were also mentoring them through the grant process. So as we're able to use the municipal and regional funding, we're also using it to train artists on other opportunities to access individual grants. So they grip this and then we have a new state and then we can do the research of the Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming here today to explain all of that. I really love hearing how far we've come through our Very excited. I'll just say one thing. The youth show that's up right now goes until June 10th. I've been learning that a bunch of parents don't actually know that the kids are in the show. <laughs> so if you know teenagers at Brooks, please spread the words and go check out the show. It's beautiful for you all to see uh, the voices of what the youth are saying. Worth so, it's about, and just before I let you go, thank you for that. You hear that, parents? Go see your kids' art show. <laughs> uh, count, uh, Director Doubt has some fun on. Yeah, I can't let you guys sit down without some comments. My grandchildren <laughs> love the art camp. And yeah, I think they probably go crazy in there. <laughs> that's the way they are. But uh, they are uh, really learning to do some individual art. Here. Your garden that's great and uh, i was at the gallery in another meeting and uh, enjoying the new there's some really high quality art on the walls thank you
Yeah. Thank you guys for what you do. Thank you. Oh, and ditto on uh, using it as a meeting space, making it a beautiful place to meet in. Awesome. You all are welcome to this remaining in the bigger space. So that brings <laughs> that brings us to previous 4.6, now 4.7, Mac Fraser with everybody deserves a model. Welcome. Nice to see some familiar faces. I think it's been a decade since we worked together. Um, a short presentation for you. Your staff has a copy of this. And forgive me, Director Doat and Director Elliott, you've heard some of this before. And Director Brander is well aware of what we're doing for. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mike Fraser, one of the community coordinators for Everybody Deserves a Smile. Uh, well, my message is complicated and long and windy. Thank you for last year's grant name. Yes. The crux of what I wanted to say today. Also, thank you, Director Brander, who helped us at a work party and saw our program in action. Everybody Deserves a Smile. That is a nonprofit organization that, in partnership with Henderson School, has completed its fourth year of operation. The program has two major components education and social action. The social action is the obvious thing that you might see around town, but the education is what really grounds this. In future human. The social action component consists of producing hand-painted kindness bags filled with a homemade card, baked cookies, warm clothing accessories, and toiletries for people in need in our region. These bags are the culmination of the other major component, a heartfelt intentional education program that is offered to school students aimed at developing and building understanding and empathy of those who are vulnerable in our community. It empowers elementary students through education, action, and offering the opportunity for youth social leadership it results in a realization that the students can make a difference. Matt Hall is the principal of Henderson School. He shared the following comments about everybody deserves a smile, Katha. Henderson Elementary School is committed to continuing to build educational resources at the school to help teach kids the value of empathy, care, and compassion. Through the use of release time for the teachers and carrying on the conversation throughout the year. Importantly, everybody deserves a smile, Katha, is helping to positively influence the citizens of tomorrow and how they will lead our community. The need for kindness bags has grown. As has the need for community support, the production of 500 bags this past year. This is twice the number produced for our community just two years ago. Our program has evolved to meet the needs of our community and has expanded from serving just underhoused individuals to now include vulnerable families and seniors as identified through our work following social agencies. Julian Powell River through the Jerry Gray Place program, Lyft through the Community Resource Center, the Cold Weather Shelter, Supportive Housing and Care Program, Salvation Army, Lang Bay Community Society, Texada Island Community Society, and thanks to Director McCormick for connecting us with the right people in Texada. And we're excited that we might be providing the educational component in the school in Texada this fall. Nicolat Recovery Center, with that stick through Poverty Law and Grace House and Kohaman Health. The increased need for kindness bags in our region brings with it an increased challenge in getting donations. Due to the current economy, more people are in need, hence the 500 bags up from the past. But likewise, fewer people can afford to, don to donate to our program. This is why we're asking for grant and aid funding again this year. We're on the road to financial sustainability. You'll see by the package we've done you with, we have a budget this year of $17,000. We're asking for $2,500 from the RD, $2,500 from the city. We're not quite past the pandemic and what we expect will be the outpouring of donations from the community in the future. First, Community Credit Union, well known as a great organization. They got us going at first with the initial cost. We recently received a standing grant from other women who care. Um, we are very close to having financial sustainability, but we need a bit of help for 
Well, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. Again, thank you for your grant in the 80s. I don't bear on that. Thank you. Um, I open the floor to the director if you may have questions. Director Brown. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I just want to say I really like the, the, the grassroots aspect of this program that uh, involves many people from the community on many levels. And uh, I just want to say I feel sorry for the individuals that got the bags that I painted because I'm no artist. We got a got some of the, the, the previous delegate from Cathad Art and get them down there painting bags. It'll be a lot better. And thanks for everything you do. Thank you. Um, anything else with questions? Uh, Director McClellan. Um, thank you. I think Director Garside also had a question. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you um, to Matt for expanding the program to Texada. I know it's much, much appreciated. And uh, and so, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for <laughs> making the connections for it. Thank you. Um, Director Garside, did I miss your hand? I didn't have my hand up, but I will ask a question. I um, wanted to thank the delegate and for the work and was wondering if there were any plans to connect with the folks on Laskiti Island as well. You haven't got plans in hand, but you put, plant the seed with me. We'll see what we can do. Um, I'm well aware of the logistical challenge that often keeps people in helping Laskiti, but that's not enough to stop us. Um, so my question is uh, uh, whether you considered um, partnerships with some of the art camps for getting your bags painted. Uh, no, we haven't. I can feel Karen looking. Um, you actually left the room. Oh, you <laughs> <asked me. laughs> we haven't, um, again, haven't put a lot to it, so we'll take a look at it. It is, as Director Brander knows, it's a pretty special thing for the children involved in the school. And it's been all in for Henderson School, and we have spread throughout the school district. The school district provides excellent support in, in all aspects of the educational component, including teacher time. We're in all, all the elementary schools except one, and we hope that will come along this fall. Um, so we make it, Part of the experience of painting the bags, but we'll take a look at it. I wouldn't be surprised if we've got duplication that some of the kids in the art camp are painting bags already. Well, my son does attend Henderson, and we are uh, director Dow. What I'm curious about is whether you've thought about expanding the program to, for example, James Thompson School, which is across the street from my house, where the bridge. Is I was talking about they want to go, go to school and they're all yes all fired up with the artistic ability and they are working school district forty seven to be an all school. Thank you, Mac Fraser. I see we come to the end of our questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Um, we are now on to the old 4.7, which is now 4.8. Sorry, Chair, file break. I guess we'll have a short bio break for <laughs> Director Lennox or any else. Yes. So, uh, five minute recess? Yeah, we'll have a five minute recess and reconvene at five minutes from now. <laughs> you have to use your almost your whole hand for that one.
Thank you. So I'm going to call us back to order, and we are on uh, 4.8, former 4.7 in your agenda package, Gary Schilling, Cathet Film Society. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Directors, Officers. Uh, happy to be here. I'm Gary Schilling, Executive Director of the Cathet Film Society, uh, formerly the Powell River Film Society. And uh, I just thought I'd start by just mentioning the mission of our society. And that's to uh, cultivate film as a cultural, educational, and an economic driver in the Cathet Regional District, Powell River, Colorado Nation, and Shishalk Nations. And um, the project that we have in front of you is our youth film camp, which is fulfills our educational portion of uh, the program. We just finished uh, in March our film festival, which is the cultural um, part of our program. And uh, interesting enough, we opened with a film that was filmed exclusively in the Cathet Regional District called Exile. And that was the our opening evening where we also had the naming ceremony for our um, auditorium, which is now called the Gotham Auditorium, which was a name that was uh, granted to us by the um, nation, meaning uh, telling stories. And uh, it's my firm belief that film is really the best uh, storytelling, most successful storytelling medium that there is, and that uh, in this day and age, um, having a certain amount of media literacy is uh, really critical. And there's real strong connections between media, media literacy and general literacy. And the, uh, the film camp that uh, we run, uh, we've seen a couple of minor changes as we've gone through, but uh, ultimately it is for uh, getting youth together. Last year it was uh, nine to 13 Youths, the age varies depending on the applications that we get. And uh, they learn the collaborative process, the creative process, and the storytelling part of the film. Um, they meet for a four-day intensive uh, film camp with mentors that are a combination of local filmmakers, which helps up my support with local filmmakers, as well as sometimes we bring uh, guests in. And uh, they produce, a, in groups of four or five, they produce a two-minute film it's then been shown in the Patricia Theater to families and the community, and is also um, posted online. Um, Film Society actually has been in our last uh, um, let's say 18 months of operation. The, the amount of money that we've brought into Cathet Regional District is frankly blows my mind. It's uh, in terms of what I my, my expectations might have been when I took on the role of being the uh, interim, so-called interim uh, fundraising chair for the film society. You know, we, uh, the community helped us purchase the theater, the uh, naming paid off our mortgage. Um, you know, BC Heritage is helping us uh, restore the front of the theater. And, uh, you know, we also have support from the River Community Foundation, uh, that uh, regional district, uh, the city through the Art Center. And, and, um, <coughs> We really, uh, you know, take uh, strongly the the importance of the Patricia Theater as a kind of uh, anchor to all those activities and the attraction that it brings. Uh, most recently, put on some TripAdvisor's list of the best, most rem beautiful remote theaters in the world. So, uh, so I think we're we're really doing a great job of uh, not just. Uh, attracting people to the theater, um, engaging the community in uh, film as a, as a cultural enrichment, and for this project, uh, getting youth involved as well. And, um, and I can't divulge the specifics, but we recently did a uh, another application to a, a, a national funder for support for uh, increasing access to the theater for the community's most vulnerable, including youth. Uh, people with disabilities, uh, uh, Klaman Nation, and, and actually we're going to deal with people with hearing disabilities. And interestingly enough, that's second to the chairs. The number one complaint we get from people is it's too loud, it's too quiet, they can't hear it, whatever it is. So our, our next, uh, very soon we'll have the abilities for people to control the sound in the theater in their own earpods through their headphones, actually some hearing aid devices and as well through uh, devices that we'll have here but specifically here today i'm talking about youth 
and our film camp, which is a, in its 15th year, if I remember it correctly, um, we offer it for free to, uh, to youth uh, in the regional district. We made a shift actually through COVID. Prior to COVID, we had youth coming from different areas to uh, that and to the theater. And uh, with COVID, we switched to keeping it local, and, and that's really been actually a really great change. So uh, we offer it free to local youth. Um, we host it at the Patricia Theater, and um, we, uh, we have a selection pro process. Last year, we had 28 um, campers. This year, we'll probably have a little bit less, 28 kids everyone streaming around the Patricia Theater. It's, a little bit hairy, but uh, well, they did produce some some good results, and I think it's a great uh, learning experience uh, for them. And I'm grateful for the support of the regional district. And um, to answer any questions you might have on on our activity on this particular project or anything else that we do. Thank you, Gary, so much. I'll open the floor to directors for questions. With, uh, if we have any, um, anybody have any questions? Uh, so I have a question. Yep. You mentioned that the amount of money you brought into the community kind of blew your mind into kind of outside of our community. Um, if you could ever get some specifics around that, I would be very much interested in seeing what that is. Um, oh, sure. It's, it's like three more grants I can easily give you. Yeah, that would be wonderful. But, uh, and it certainly was... Uh, was Triggered in part by uh, uh, the importance of the Patricia Theater, not just as a community place, but as a architecturally and, and statistically and all that. Kind of thing. It's the whole country. The whole country, yes. And and, uh, um, and hopefully, contractors willing, um, this, by the end of this year, we'll have the exterior of the theater brought back to when it was in 1928, complete with the canopy. And an original stained glass sign. Yeah. Um, stained glass sign. Okay. Um, do I have Director Garside with her hand up? Uh, Director McCormick had her hand up before me too. I think if she wants to go first, she's shaking her head. So I'll I'll ask first. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, certainly an all-encompassing engagement project for your community. And uh, I was I was curious because I, because I didn't see any reference to it, and uh, I'm not familiar uh, being a new delegate to the board with your project. What kinds of community feedback you have been getting specifically? Well, the only the only immediate community feedback that we get is uh, the applause at the end of the <laughs> screening of uh, of the five or six youth films that we. That we project, um, and I've had thanks, personal thanks from parents whose children have uh, attended the, the film camp. But uh, it's not one of those things where um, the, the real response is really the youth and, and how much they enjoy uh, the experience. Thank you. That was that was more what I was leaning towards from the kids themselves and their families in, in terms of how it's helping them progress in what, whatever way that is. Thank you. Director McCormick. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, question, are you limited to 28 kids or could you expand? Uh, I think actually 28 is beyond capacity. Um, the, uh, part, of the, part, of the, uh, part of it is, uh, is financial. We, we do uh, so I should say that the, the camp get it, gets its primary funding from BC Gaming, and uh, um, most years it happens. You know, not as, as fundraising is never guaranteed, but we have we have contingency within the Home Society that if funding is missed for a year, the project will continue. Um, in in any case. Um, so follow up then. Um, how many do you anticipate having this year? And do you anticipate any coming from the surrounding islands? Um, and what allowances there might be made for those kids? Um, so, um, as a result of COVID, 
life got very complicated. So we did our best to simplify what we do. And so and in part, uh, part of the complexity of the program in previous years was dealing with campers coming from other places, housing them, taking care of them, dealing with, you know, privacy and security issues um, and, and such. And by changing it to just local children where we don't take any responsibility for them getting to Powell River, they are just here and are their parents or caregivers drop them off in the morning like they would any other place and pick them up at the end of the day. Um, I would say we're not restricting that, but we're not taking the responsibility of travel. So if someone wants to apply and says that a friend in um, a river that they can stay with and that, that housing is not an issue, then, then they're welcome to keep them. But we're, our focus is going to be um, youth from their regional district. Thank you. Uh, the record out. I just want to comment. I've been here for a little while. I remember back in the day when uh, there were the impossible ideas about how to, how to get over the cost of getting and supporting the building and how to try to find a cure for that. An impossible society yourself. And to try to find a group that could actually take ownership of it and spend money. And, Keep the theater going. I went through that, and uh, just trying to keep the theater alive was a challenge, as opposed to finding business to put in there and operate. Uh, we operate it now. So thanks for everything you've been fighting to. It's been from the program to try to save the Patricia Theater to try to operate where it was valued and contribute to the community. Thanks for what you do, but you have to remember it's been a struggle to get. It's, it's been a huge learning experience this past um, October 2021 was when we purchased the theater um, after it had been closed through the COVID and then financial reasons for like 18 months. Um, so yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a real challenge. And of course, every week something new in the building breaks down as a, as a further challenge to get these things, things going in. Uh, we still have lots of work to do, but I'm, I'm comfortable that uh, our, our next step will actually be uh, trying to get federal funding and recognizing the theater as a, uh, a, a historical and cultural space. And um, I think, uh, yeah, so we, we, we've got work to do, but, uh, but certainly the, the, we feel like the, the, at least the, the rock that we were pushing up the hill is now uh, maybe reached. That's where we will take a final question. Yeah, Director Lennox. Thanks. Just quickly, uh, I, I did see some of the comments here um, from parents and others about the impact on the kids. So really cool. Uh, my daughter worked at the theater a long time ago, and uh, it is a very cool um, place and really cool to hear what you're doing with it. And then I just finally, this request that you got is for two thousand yeah. dollars for this program. That's correct for the kids, just so we're back on track yeah. with the, the, what, the today's uh, ask is is for our is supporting our, our youth program where I think the full budget is in there and so we're looking for about two thousand dollars. Thank you so much, Mr. Shelley. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, that's, uh, we're going to be thank, thank you so much. Um, so that brings us to the former 4.8 Christie Life Cycle Housing. Staff, I did not know I would be asked to do a presentation, so I didn't. We did present a cover letter with an application. Did the directors receive that letter? Mm -hmm. Then I will simply ask you to ask me questions. I don't want to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we have any um, questions from directors for? Go ahead, director. Yes, chair. Uh, just one quick question. In your application, it shows uh, what areas your initiative benefit electoral area C. I was curious, the residents that you have or that you place in the Bay homes, are they necessarily from Area C prior to that, or they can be pulled from anywhere in that region? 
know, some of them have come from other areas of the region. Okay. But most of them have been there. Right, right. I mean, it's not a, I guess it's not a prerequisite to placing somebody that they be from area C. So it really could be seen as a benefit to That's true. That, yeah, that's correct. We, we rent to locals. We don't advertise vacancies outside of town. No, no, no. I wasn't into saying that. Just that you could pull residents from area A or the city or from wherever they might be. If they wanted to live. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? I do not see any questions from the directors. So thank you so much for coming and being available for these questions. We really appreciate them. Thank you. And that brings us to uh, the former 4.9, uh, to Wayne West for the Cleary Island Nature Conservatory. Can you hear me? I can hear you, go ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present. Uh, and uh, Laskidi Island Nature Conservancy is a land trust and uh, a volunteer organization looking um, at the conservation of uh, nature reserves and the development of um, further protected areas on Laskiti um, and the surrounding uh, immediate islands in the archipelago. Um, thank you for uh, the grant and aid support we received uh, previously and um, Our communication and outreach is an important part of what we do on the island. Um, we're uh, promoting conversations on um, the special attributes of the land and ecosystems here. And we want to see the island move from about 10% protected lands to um, uh, 100% increase to 20% in uh, the next five year period. Uh, and these are uh, parallel to overall land use goals uh, nationwide. Um, our outreach program consists of uh, newsletters. Um, we put out uh, three uh, a year, uh, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, we also uh, try to have a series of workshops, uh, hikes on the island, and uh, a major event uh, every summer with uh, natural, natural history, nature conservation based themes. We also tend to have a presence at uh, our summer market as well, all part of uh, outreach. The grant and aid we received um, previously um, and that we're uh, requesting again is um, it it covers the cost uh, of uh, the publication of our newsletter and uh, it's one of the uh, it's one of the the, uh, the initiatives that the um, the the trust gets uh, significant feedback on that it's it's valued in the community and the uptake is is uh, is high. Um, so we are uh, looking at about sixteen thousand in our overall uh, communication program, and the grant and aid amounts to two thousand five hundred. Which has allowed us the, the we use for the for the the printing costs uh, for the, for the newsletter. Shall I discuss both projects, or shall I take questions on the first one first and go into the second? So we would we have a clock for your presentation for ten minutes, and then we take questions at the end. Okay. 
So the second, uh, the second application uh, was for um, our uh, uh, landowner stewardship program, which we're hoping to uh, develop. Um, and uh, the intention of this is to um, produce a produce a, a forum for communication around um, new uh, landholders on the island, but as well uh, conversations potentially with current uh, landholders who want to um, take into consideration conservation values on their land and the options for them to do that. Um, a lot of the trust islands have um, initiatives uh, around um, uh, encouraging uh, conservation of the unique attributes uh, of the um, island's land, private stewardship. Uh, there's, no, there, there's, very, there's limits to what can be achieved in conservation through uh, uh, publicly owned land or, or the limited amount of crown land. So uh, private stewardship initiatives we feel need to be uh, supported and uh, the profile of them raised. What we're hoping to do is um, have um, a workshop with expertise on uh, forestry, um, endangered species uh, or species at risk, uh, invasives, and uh, potentially also the liabilities that come with uh, land. Uh, typically here, one of the unique aspects of Laskidi as an island, lots of stuff comes to us it's very difficult or there's never any plan for how to get it off. So a lot of the property on the island, if it changes hands, can come with a significant uh, environmental liability, derelict vehicles, boats, uh, historic dumps, uh, a range of issues. And there isn't um, a formalized process uh, to um, to to deal with this, uh, the so the the idea is a a workshop, and then to generate a a template which can be uh, discussed with. Uh, interested landowners and also uh, to create uh, trained volunteers who can um, work and facilitate in these discussions with landowners where the interest exists. Um, and um, the benefits as we see it um, are um, Opportunity to address the issues of endangered ecological zones, uh, identification of uh, important uh, critical uh, habitats on private land, um, dealing with issues of invasives, also helping on um, one of our environmental issues is a um, high degree of damage from excessive herbivory through a high deer population as well as our feral sheep. So if landowners are interested in uh, fencing uh, solutions, uh, things like this, this expertise can also be um, passed on that way. Um, we hope to draw on the, the best uh, practices from other trust islands that are uh, moving ahead with this work and in our view, the benefits to the regional district would be um, that we would potentially develop a template 
but there's interest in the regional district islands or I'm sure parallel uh, issues and the um, uh, mainland areas of the regional district as well. Because the issues that we're dealing with are common to uh, the dry coastal Douglas, Douglas forest ecotype, which um, we all share. Can I take questions now? Okay. So thank you so much, Mr. West. I'll open the floor to directors for questions. We'll start with Director Lennon. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, you, you actually, one of your last points there, maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Uh, in Area A, which I represent, we have the Savory Island Land Trust, and um, they also have a grant application uh, submitted, and a lot of their intentions are the same and quite laudable, and, and both of your groups are, are doing good work for your communities. I'm wondering about, have you reached that leveraging each other point where uh, where you're, you're in communications with the other islands or other trusts to uh, to work on things like your stewardship program? Because you know, I think your objectives are quite similar. Yes, um, we we have, um, and that's one of the reasons um, we're proposing uh, in this process a workshop because we want to draw on the leadership of of other uh, island communities, and uh, there's always a lot of commonalities, but it seems there's been often. A specific problem where exp expertise has gotten a little ahead. Sometimes we can we can borrow from, and that's yeah. We don't want to duplicate anybody's work, but we want to uh, move everybody ahead if possible. Thank you, thank you, Mr. West. Any other questions from the director? It looks like we have come to the end of the questions. I want to really thank you for being here, Mr. West, and making. Um, this presentation to us. Um, and we can excuse you for the next delegate who is 4.11, Brandon Lapine, Regional Production Services Manager, and John Miller, the Executive Director for Vancouver Island North Film Festival. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, Joan Miller, my Executive Director, can't make it. She was pulled away on another call, but uh, uh, I have a short uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation I'd like to share. Um, I admit I'm not so tech savvy, so please bear with me for a moment. Um, yeah, sorry. I don't think I'll be able to share it. I'm having a little difficulties that way. But I believe it was all sent to members of the board. And I'll just uh, just go over the points. So the in in films a not for profit uh, the Vancouver Island North Film Commission in film was formed in uh, 2001 in response to growing interest in filming in the North Island. Uh, we oh, are, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but we do have the presentation here available, and we can put it up if you could just work with us to tell us when you want this, the slides changed. Oh sure, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. <laughs> Can you yes. see what's going on there? Uh, yes, uh, Apple Season 1C with Jason Momoa at the Discovery Park in Calumba River. Um, All right, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, to the second screen. Um, yeah, so uh, as I was saying, in film, the Vancouver Island North Film Commission, uh, it was formed in 2001 in, a, in response to a growing interest of film uh, in the region. We are uh, the Association of Film Commissioners International Certified. There's 350 film commissions globally, uh, 40 countries on every continent except Antarctica. We haven't figured out how to film penguins yet. Um, we are certified. Uh, recently, I've joined the commission in September of this year, uh, 2022. Uh, as a result of that, we have restructured uh, the commission itself. There's two full-time employees, myself, and I'm the Regional Production Services Manager, and Ms. Joan Miller, our Executive Director, and finally Tanya Price, who's a part-time and our Communications Person. Uh, she deals with the social media, the tech stuff that I'm not so good at. Um, we want to slip slides? Uh, highlights at a glance. 
Uh, the mandate of the uh, Film Commission is to attract and facilitate motion pictures. Basically, we create jobs and bring revenue into our region. Our region is made up of the Film Commission is made up of the six regions of the North Island, including the Guthut region. Uh, to date, we have serviced 253 productions, bringing in a total impact of just over 185 million. Um, our return for investment is for every dollar invested, we bring back 120 into the community. Um, due to being a not-for-profit and certified with the FCI, um, we don't accept any any uh, um, compensation for our services from the productions themselves. Um, we are just an economic driver and do our best to, to like I said, bring revenue and jobs into our uh, into our region. If we want to go to the third side, thank you. Um, recently, we have applied and received the uh, a REDEP grant, uh, Rural Economic Diversification Infrastructure Program. Um, and we're using that. It is a three-prong um, initiative we have. Uh, first of all, we are going to update what's called Real Scout, our online tool that allows producers and productions from around the world to view the location files we have for the region. Um, what we want to do is we want to bring in photographers from each of the regions, including Guthet, bring them in, have a workshop, not to take pictures, to learn how to take pictures, but rather to take them and package them so that it makes sense to producers, directors, and uh, production designers. We would upload those and allow more productions to see the beautiful, the beautiful locations we have. Um, as I said, we are looking. We'll be looking to hiring a couple from the Gethut region, um, and it's more of a commission, more of a, a sorry contract work, kind of a side hustle. Um, we're looking at eighteen months to capture these images, looking for about one hundred and fifty for each of the six regions. Additionally, we are going to be looking towards uh, um, bringing on drone operators to. Uh, um, do drone shots, overhead shots. Um, we're in particular, we're interested in seasonal changes. Um, it's rather new technology in film as part of the scouting process, and we're really excited. We believe it'll generate a lot of interest. Um, with drone work, it reduces the cost for productions as opposed to before it'd be helicopters and planes and stuff like that. Um, we're very excited to, to, to bring this on board. Additionally, um, we've received funding for um, a larger, larger presence uh, international in the U.S., Canada, and B.C., uh, attending symposiums, conferences, panels, uh, that sort of thing, getting our name out, creating packages to talk directly to studios, producers. Um, we, in addition, we plan on hosting uh, several workshops. Actually, just uh, last week, I was at the Comox Valley Film Festival giving a little presentation, some Q&A to upcoming uh, filmmakers and film workers. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing the locations uh, workshop. That'll be the drones and the scouts. Adi in addition, we plan on bringing in people uh, from Creative BC, the umbrella organization for uh, British Columbia filming, as well as the Canadian Producers Association to talk to local filmmakers about how they can get their projects greenlit, how they can move forward, how we can have local content increased. Uh, additionally, we will be holding workshops with local government, speakers from local government and First Nations to, uh, um, again, do the same thing, Je just generate local content for film. We, we live in paradise. The, the North Island is absolutely incredible, the Gothet region, all of it is incredible, and there's no reasons why we should have filmmakers going to Vancouver to film when we can bring the Vancouver film industry to the North Island. Um, do we want to go slip to the fourth slide? or fifth one, I believe, um, our workforce training. Uh, this is very exciting. Uh, the North Island Film Commission has been working with North Island College since 2017 to produce tuition-free skills training. These are micro-credential courses running approximately 14 weeks, a blend of online and person. Um, we've been doing that since 2017 with wild results, just, just incredible. To date, we've had over 450 graduates of a program. These courses are accredited by the unions, allowing uh, graduates of a program to fast track their union memberships, uh, uh, bypass part of the whole uh, permittee status, get them working on film sets quicker. Um, it will really help productions to have trained crew on site, ha have them in the North Island, in the regions, ready 
ready for productions to come. Currently, there is a global slowdown in production. Um, the Writers Guild of America has gone on strike and it ripples effects throughout the world. Um, we don't have a timeline when it ends. The 2007 strike lasted 100 days and that led to a surplus, a boon of the film industry. It was uh, wild days. I've come from the Vancouver uh, film world and yeah, we were busy, busy. So uh, once the strike gets over, I'm assuming we're gonna be very busy. For the commission itself, we received a lot of interest, um, a lot of inquiries and uh, requests for location packages um, for shooting in the fall. So I believe the producers are believing that the strike will be a short one. Um, additionally, with this uh, uh, work for skills training, uh, the commission has acquired a locations kit and we plan on traveling remotely for people who can't make it to our program in Vancouver. Uh, we want to go there. Uh, First Nation lands, uh, smaller communities remote, bring our services to them, train up uh, uh, the production assistant program entry level into film and front load preparing for the productions that will come. Um, the last slide is a little video. It is a, uh, a one minute video from our 2023 um, training program. We uh, created a, um, a set. Uh, our departments we represent this year, every year we have our core departments, uh, locations, grips, lighting, uh, set construction. And this year we were able to add the set dressers program. Next year we're looking at some additional ones. Um, and this is one little one minute video behind the scenes showing uh, uh, what, what it's about, some of the instruction, some feedback from the students, if we were able to play that. And that'll be the next next slide. We're working on it. <laughs> oh. Without having sound is the problem. I can I can narrate. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, just play it, and he'll narrate. Me. Uh, um, that's the film set we bet, uh, built. It. I know. This year's program was a uh, um, a uh, um, time machine, mad scientist type thing. So the set was built by our set construction students and all our instructors are uh, union members in good standing. They work with the college and with the commission to create these programs. Everyone you're seeing is, uh, that's Joan. Everyone you're seeing is a student. They're learning right then and there. I myself taught the uh, production assistant program I have to say, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Uh, several of our students have already been working in film. Um, uh, resident alien film, Lady Smith, uh, early this year. Several of our graduates were on that. Um, I'm talking about the awesomeness of the program. Uh, again, set construction is just gearing towards the making. Um, so it was 12 weeks of online program. Uh, that That's just baking soda. Um, 12, 12 weeks of the online program and then two weeks at Martini Studios that uh, uh, we actually did the hands-on training. They helped the tools, they learned the lingo, uh, worked with it. We had a director, actual actors, um, and we put it together. It was, uh, it was amazing. Um, we also, also offer accounting and craft services, not every year. We kind of mix them up a bit. Um, again, don't, don't speaking. These are our set dressers. Uh, that's one of our PAs. Her in particular was a Ukrainian refugee. Um, it was very, very exciting to learn to teach her and learn about her story in the Ukraine. So we, um, have, we have come to the end of the time by over a minute <laughs> for your your presentation, and it looks like the video is quite like over an hour. <laughs> according to oh no, up. that was uh, it. Should have been only a minute and. 49 minutes. About halfway? Okay. Carry yeah, on. Sorry. And uh, yeah, just, just interviewing some students. Uh, I'm talking about the program. I believe we had several students from the Gathet region this year. Um, additionally, myself, I've reached out in September. I uh, did a little, little visit, spoke with the uh, CAO of the region, and then uh, um, the CDO and director of properties for the city of Powell River. Uh, I shot some uh, scouting files. Uh, due to the nature of our of our uh, 
of our business, I can't talk about specifics, but we do have several productions that are looking at the Gathet region for filming. Uh, most recently, it was we had Slumberland filming in the Tubi Inlet, of course, Exile, which you heard about, and then The Verge. And The Verge is playing on um, Netflix right now. It was shot in 2021. And a great documentary about the uh, the Eldridge rock face. And then, yes, I'm just uh, doing the lighting. And actually, I think this might be a longer version of the video. So if you do want to stop it, uh, it's understandable. We are past our time. Yeah, I was thinking it's uh, probably we've seen the enough of that. And thank you so much for the presentation. I'm going to open the floor for questions uh, from the directors, uh, if there's any questions from the directors at this time. Uh, uh, Director McLaren. Oh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. I really like the aspect of hiring um, and training uh, local people to have the skills to be able to be employed. I'm thinking, though, that there are some other areas that would be uh, part and parcel of a film industry that aren't mentioned, such as um, makeup, um, costumes, um, you know, etc. So is there um, any kind of training or um, work with some local people to help them develop the kinds of skills that would aid in the support of the film industry? Um, yes, it's good. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Just recently, I've had uh, several people inquire uh, about how they get into the makeup, costumes, wardrobe department. Uh, those particular departments, what they are is makeup artists, costumers, and uh, um, hair, hairdressers uh, who have already established careers and then translate into the film industry. So it's, it's one of those skills that you have the skill first and then you move in the industry. So uh, the introduction to the filming, uh, introduction, introduction to the film industry will the PA program that will give them the required certifications that's another thing the program we offer them all the certifications training and they are cross industry um, what what they uh, uh, learn on the courses they can bring like traffic control lift that kind of thing but uh, most the industry requires a minimal courses uh, orientation women's that sort of thing we offer that and then with those courses and someone's uh, background in makeup they would be able to enter the industry. So skills like that, they're specific and then they're able to translate into film. We just help with the the uh, required courses to make into that. So we unfortunately can't offer makeup or costumes or anything, it would be a multi-year program, but we can, existing artists, help them transition into the industry. There's a quick follow-up, thank you. Um, yeah, and that that is totally appreciated. Um, I guess my final uh, comment, half question, is um, in our region there are three islands, um, all of whom have full-time residents. I represent Texada, um, Shelly is here representing Laskiti, and Savory is part of Area A. So I'm just hoping that in your film uh, location scouting that you will include the three islands um, in your work. I'm really Thank glad you brought that up. Um, Texada Island just recently a local producer was looking towards it filming in uh, I believe it's Blubbery Bay. Um, Blubbery they were Bay. unable to uh, um, work work out an agreement with the local I believe it was a cement company. Uh, whatever company was doing work there they were they were unable to reach a uh, an agreement but it is it is uh, we do have files we will be updating those files and they are files that I do I do we do show show to producers um, a lot of very unique looks savory island the hawaii of uh, bc uh, texada with the beautiful beautiful landscape and then laskiti we have some files on i, I admit i'm not so familiar with laskiti unfortunately thank you director garza uh actually ends up being a follow-up question to director mccormick's question um because you had mentioned getting into some of the smaller communities. So I'd love to know what your plan is to do that. And uh, I'm sure you'd be more than welcome to come to Laskiti with a group and uh, be shown around and, and learn a little bit more at some point. But my question, of course, I'm going back to what is your plan for reaching out to some of the smaller islands and getting more of Quathet involved in this? I really do appreciate and applaud the skills that you're offering. And I'm sure and I hope that um, 
our respective schools are, are, are being talked to, that somebody will be able to come in and talk to the kids and get them interested in, in your projects, because I think it's a wonderful opportunity. So I, I await your answer on that. Thank you. Yes, uh, th thank you for asking that question. Um, so we, ha we have uh, uh, recently purchased capital assets, a what's called a locations kit. And as I mentioned earlier, the production assistant is the entry level. Uh, when we are talking about going to remote re regions to, to teach hands-on, boots on the ground, it's the, the production assistant program. Um, with that under their belt, then, then people from these communities would be able to access the other programs uh, that we hold annually, and it, it, it would create an interest. Um, we have found, and I do not mean to speak in generalities, we found for a lot of the remote communities, it's it's it, it's difficult to prompt people to leave there to to come to these courses. We pay for uh, all all the travel and everything, but it's it's a comfort thing. So we've decided uh, we're going to purchase a large, uh, probably a three ton truck, have our locations kit, and I'll personally go there and teach. We'll offer the online program, and then I'll physically go there and, and teach. Um, on a personal note, uh, this is the first year I've ever taught. I've ever taught, and it has been the single most rewarding experience of my life. I look forward to 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 teaching this. Uh, I've given some speak, given some presentations to uh, the youth media program and Comox and, and other other programs like that. And it's something uh, personally, and professionally, I'm looking so forward to it. It is a direction we really want to go. To the best of my knowledge, we are the only film commission in the entire world that offers programs like this, uh, completely tuition free. We pay for everything, and it's just we just want to we just want to we just want to grow our region. We uh we we have all the locations. We just need the the trained people and to bring productions here. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I I agree, and we'll hold your feet to that. <laughs> We're just uh, running shy on time for this slot, but I did have one clarifying question for you. Uh, one of the slides you mentioned that we had two hundred and fifty three productions in the region, totaling one hundred and eighty five million or some sort. The slide said five hundred and twenty three. So I just wanted to clarify: is it two fifty three or five twenty three? Uh, for the number of productions, I believe it was five forty three, and then the okay. uh, uh, total. The total was, I think, 187 million. Okay, thank you. I just, when you were speaking, you had a different number. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I was reading off the slide. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. We're gonna, yes, uh, I can excuse you now. Thank you so much. Uh, you. So that brings us to uh, 4.11, Brandon Lapine. Oh, 4.12. Sorry. 4.12. Mm -hmm. Gerald, that was you. <laughs> Gerald Child, uh, Childress, yep. Theta Island Culture and Tourism Society. <laughs> well, I'm representing ah. Texas Arts, Culture, and Tourism. Texas has no, uh, they've had the arts program. Our, since this was since 2004, um, in the early 1900s, they had the only opera house in San Francisco. They also had the only phone system where we could talk to anybody. <laughs> just ourselves. <laughs> yeah, just ourselves. So, in fact, uh, there's a number of events. They do uh, on the Rock, they do the Texas uh, Blues and Roots Festival, they do the Aerospace Camp. They do uh, the Texas Artist Studio Tour. They do uh, the fly-in. Um, just to speak a little bit, the fly-in, uh, the artist uh, or the uh, fly-in, and they uh, have a big celebration. And this finishes off the week when you have the aerospace camp, and the aerospace camp is fully booked for you. In fact. We're looking at uh, creating a couple of spots for some people, uh, children, that um, possibly couldn't go. We have one supporter here in Oliver uh, that pays for their food. We're also going to do three email participants and learn about why. Airspace, 
we have a, for lack of a better word, it's called Airbus. And, and you go with it, and you actually look. You press the button, and you get the bands and sound apply, which looks like a little place, no wheels, and you can fly from Chicago. You take off and you crash or you land or whatever. Or at least you don't get it. And so a lot of people are, are into that. Um, the artist studio tour is uh, where people go and go to Texada, visit Texada, and you bring up tourism and you go to those different artists' places, either way or whatnot. Um, see, Blues and Roots uh, does something unique. They're one of the few festivals that takes all the artists with the 100 feet circle of the event, which is kind of cool because uh, there's so many good artists here. Um, the, uh, Run the Rock is probably one of the most true Run the Rock. It is not flat. <laughs> they do the 20K and people uh, come here and they they come because it's so hard. So, um, we've applied for funding before, we've had funding before. And uh, last year we were challenged with uh, um, COVID still. Uh, some events didn't happen. We took our funding and we put it into promoting uh, ads, videos. Now we're on Google. We have a whole new marketing committee that's um, promoting the whole island. Once we find uh, some people, when they get the island, they, uh, especially boaters, or uh, fly in, they, they come back every year. And so we've we created a lot of tourism, and it's just pushed in that community. Yeah, that's probably about it. Uh, uh, tourism, huge. The arts, and uh, one time we actually used to be able to catch Paul River to the arts. It would change our ferry schedule so much. Nine twenty is the last one. It used to be midnight, not that long ago, and it was ten o'clock at night. So we do promote some events. We just helped out with Grant Lawrence. Grant Lawrence was at the Gillespie Hall. And that was a nice little event. So last year we did a. Uh, the ships come in and do a play in, in the harbor in Power Ray. Or not Power Ray, in Canada. So they're always promoting the island. Any questions? I'll find out. Uh, yeah. Open the floor for questions from directors if we have any. Uh, we have Director McClendon. Um, thank you, Jerry, for your presentation. There's no question in my mind that what TAC does enriches the lives of people on Texada, and that just goes simply without saying. Um, I'm really happy to have to run the rock back. It's been a few years since we've done that. But my question to you is that um, you do other things as well. Um, are you not producing a hiking um, brochure? And is that oh, not oh, oh yes, we, we do. And, and uh, we produce uh, different things. Rock cards, the hiking brochure is a big one because uh, there's so many places to hike on the island and we put it into a format. We're working on putting one in for um, the bike routes, all the mountain biking, that sort of thing. And, um, and actually on Texada, um, say the biking world, Anderson Bay is the place to go. People come to Texada, come to Canada, have breakfast, and they bike to Anderson Bay. And the next morning, they bike to Bailey Bay, and then they go home. It's apparently, in the biking world, that's the thing to do. Did you have a follow-up? Um, no, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Do I have any other questions from Jerry? I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That uh, brings us to 4.13 on the agenda. Tyler 
uh, the Fall River Salmon Society. Yeah, how you doing? Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, my name is Tyler Barkfin. I work for the Power of a Salmon Society. I wear a number of hats there, but I do a lot of our fish culture activities as well as education and community outreach. I'm just going to talk to you guys a bit about a grant application we have in um, and clarify and answer any questions you might have. So this grant uh, will help our organization's resiliency and longevity in the face of many social, economic, and environmental changes. The Power River Salmon Society has been in operation since 1982, successfully working towards the enhancement and preservation of Pacific salmon. The benefits of our work can be seen not only in the consistent fish returns at Land Creek, but also in a community of salmon champions we've helped to create. This year alone, we reared and released 1.5 million salmon fry to Land Creek, Willingdon Creek, and Moat Creek combined on Texada. We run an extensive water monitoring program and have a strong online presence through salmonpreservation.org and salmoneducation.org. Additionally, we host uh, a myriad of education and outreach events to ensure strong community engagement with the work we do and with Pacific Salmon. All of this is balanced with the ever-growing demand to fundraise to meet the requirements of our objectives and all members of the Cathet Regional District uh, benefit from our enhancement work, our free education initiatives, and publicly accessible green space. Uh, the focus of the grant uh, we have submitted is for our organization's resiliency. Uh, the bulk of the grant will be dedicated towards upgrading our current uh, truck dump box, which is very worn down through years of heavy use. Uh, this box is imperative in not only the transportation of our fish for releases, but for moving materials for projects such as our Excel accessibility projects out of the Lang, uh, out of Lang Creek at the Alex Dobler Salmon Center, um, and in use during our water monitoring program. The rest of the funds will focus on our water quality program, which will be in replacing um, some temperature monitors, tidbits, um, which are used to continually collect water temperature recordings every 15 minutes at four different locations. Uh, we'd also like to upgrade the technology and office space out of the Alex Dobler Salmon Center at Lang Creek to be able to maintain um, our continuous river data and to accommodate um, our increased presence on the site because of the increased traffic the area is seeing. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have on the specifics of the grant and or our organization. Thank you guys. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Uh, we'll start with Director Lennox. Yeah, thanks for your presentation uh, and support the work that you're doing. And I want to see a few more uh, marked fish out there when I'm living out there on the ocean. But uh, I just don't see the actual grant request number. I might have missed it in the presentation here. So, uh, yeah. Sure. So the the actual ask um, is just under thirty thousand dollars. The bulk of which is the truck box, which the quotes we've got are around. Um, 24,000. Um, the remainder of the items um, are those temperature loggers, which we're looking to get eight of them. The newer um, versions are Bluetooth. Um, so the, the temperature loggers themselves um, are about $2,000. The um, having a, getting a new device to be able to read those by Bluetooth, a, a new dedicated phone essentially. Um, it's fifteen hundred bucks, and then some odds and ends out of Lang Creek for just under uh, two thousand. Yeah, I see it now. It's under your expenses, uh, and you've itemized them. So. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, for clarity, the number twenty nine thousand five hundred sixteen is your request. Yes. Thank you. Um, Director Brandner. Thanks, Chair. I had the exact same question. <laughs> I think the budget has been done. Differently. Yeah, in, incorrectly. But that, that was my same question. I didn't know what the question was. And Director McCormick, that was your question as well? No. No. Uh, yeah. um, Sorry. My, I have a different question. Um, oh, thank on, you man. for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering about the amount of food that you give the fish. I say this because, of course, I know people involved on the Texada um, Salmon Enhancement Project. And one of the concerns that I've heard is that there's only two weeks worth of food. There used to be three. And I'm just wondering if any of the uh, grant funding is going toward um, additional food for the hatchlings before they're released. 
Um, yeah, we've tried to relatively um, keep that separate. The timing of um, the fish isn't really as much a limitation on the food. An, an extra week's worth of food for the Texada fish would be a few hundred dollars. So it wouldn't be too substantial. It's just usually fisheries release windows and release sizes that we're aiming for. Um, so uh, for imprinting uh, on Texada, that's just been typically what's been uh, suggested by our, our community advisor and what's been, been lined up there. But that could be um, changed upon uh, you're receiving a request from them? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So a lot of the communications with the Texada group itself and with our fish does go through the RDFO community advisor um, who just changed to uh, be Jim Wilson um, and he typically advises on that. So if that's something that's deemed to be um, uh, beneficial, then, then that's something we can absolutely uh, look at accommodating for sure. Thank you. Any other questions from directors? Seeing none, uh, awesome. thank you so much for no coming. Worries. And um, if uh, I see if I have filled out that budget incorrectly, let me know if you would like me to revise that and send a different copy over um, and I can uh, adjust accordingly. Okay, thank you. I'm sure staff will follow up. Um, <laughs> thank you so much and uh, uh, thank you for being here. Um, that brings us to 4.14. Paul Cummings, Townsite Jazz Festival Director. He was here. I see him leaving. Uh, yeah, a couple about minutes ago. Outside <laughs> smoke? I don't think he's a smoker. He's going to play that trumpet. <laughs> he was good in the boat. To be the teaching class. Oh, teaching takes sorry. priority. Yeah. So we will skip past for now to uh, 4.15, which is uh, Paula Santo from Lyft. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Paula Santo. You said it perfectly. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am the community support manager at Lyft Community Services. Um, thank you very much for accommodating me and double picking myself. I thought that was very good to today. Um, the Community Resource Center, I'm asking for $50,000, which I do every year, generous folks. Um, and that is basically operational funding. Um, mostly is basically. Um, the Community Resource Center is a drop in center on Joyce Avenue, very conveniently lo located for everyone. Um, we are open from noon to four for drop-in, Monday through Thursday, so 16 hours of drop-in a week. But we do have staff on site from like 8 or 8.30 in the morning until four, so we do private appointments as well um, during those hours. Things like legal services, um, we offer space for uh, VCH outreach to meet with people in the community. We're a safe space for folks. Um, the library will meet with folks if they, if they need to, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, we're a low barrier drop-in, so we no longer take people's names at the door. But we do, staff try their hardest to capture the stats, like how many people are actually coming in. Um, that's dependent on staff capacity, but we do, we, we monitor how many people are coming in per day and we see which resources they are accessing. But we do not specifically ask where are you from or anything like that. Uh, but we know anecdotally from conversations with all these private appointments that we think approximately minimum 30% are in district residents. Um, quite a few come from Texada. We're right next to the bus stop, right? Like right behind the mall there. So um, it's a nice place for folks to drop in, wait for the taxi to get down to the ferry or we have free coffee, free services, um, no barriers. Um, yeah, um, we are sort of the, the place where people can go when they have no place else to turn, um, when they are feeling very frustrated by all the systems in place. So we do lots and lots of applications for 
for instance, setting people up with a MyCRA account and a My Services Canada account because they realize that their old age security never kicked in and now they have to actually apply for it. Those kinds of things. Um, we offer free tax clinics, so we get lots and lots of seniors coming to that. So about 40% of the people who serve as seniors in this community, many of them are in vehicles. Um, anyway. Hopefully, I am sharing a picture of how valuable this resource is to our community, and that is why I asked for this. I had a slideshow. I actually used the same slideshow as last year. Seriously, I didn't have time to do a new one. And our stats, it's its basically, I didn't have too many stats in it. It's mostly just the things that we do, but it's mostly what I just told you. So if you would like to run through that, we can. It's very short. I think it's only four slides, right? If you just let me know when you'd like to. Sure, go. let's start right in. See if I missed anything. Um, yeah, we offer hot lunches every day, Monday to Thursday, between 30 and 4 to 5 um, hot lunches. And then we have a free fridge where which we stock uh, with the help of Savon and some other local retailers. So there are lots more meals available. Um, right now, we're getting anywhere between 80 and 120 people a day. Um, yeah, we have other specialists come in, like public health work comes in. Um, we have the community integration specialists from the ministry come in and meet with them. Free laundry and lots and lots and lots of support for housing, even though we have no magic wand to wave, but we can at least make sure people have checked all of their lists, gotten themselves on the appropriate list. Yeah, just all of the the things that we when folks come through the door and ask us to help with we try to fill it up so coffee. <laughs> thank you so much um did, are you finished your i think i'm finished sure but i'm here for questions i'll open the floor to directors for questions if they have any yeah, thanks. I just noticed in your application that you do not apply for any grant funding for the city of Boulder. Um, we have in the past and not gotten any. Um, I don't know who there were the Tennessee section. I guess that would be an application. Uh, we didn't get that. I have applied for that. I think, sorry, so. I, I should actually say, though, um, for instance, the garden out back, we do have a community garden in the back. It's quite beautiful. Uh, the um, sorry. <laughs> uh, Fall River Community Forest gave us a lovely right. grant last year um, and also gave us a beautifully large grant to renovate the and the this prevention site, which we is located on the site. So we have gotten that, but we don't actually specifically ask for funds for operation on the CRC itself. That's the distinction with our budgets. Yeah, because you've uh, you've separated the CRC budget yes. in two hundred and whatever thousand. Yeah. So, so this is strictly just for staffing um, a little bit of the food costs and yeah, operating. So this grant would be uh, applied just to the CRC operations, not your old generation. Exactly. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Trying to pay attention. So do we have any other directors with questions today? It looks like everybody is really clear on your program. <laughs> I hope so. We're tired. <laughs> and we're hot and tired, one or the other. Yeah, well, and th thank you for coming here today and uh, making time to take our questions. Thank you. And again, thanks for re accommodating my Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're welcome.
So we do have a 4.16 unregistered delegation, Adam Gagnon from Cat That Prep. So you will be given 10 minutes for your presentation at this time. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Adam Gagnon. Uh, I'm here to represent the Cathet Pride Society. Um, pardon me for uh, if I didn't follow the procedure. I've just very recently joined the board. Uh, and I'm trying to fill in for John Hewson, who I think perhaps some of you have in the past. Um, so I think we have a, I think we have a outstanding grant application for uh, funding for uh, our pride operations. Uh, this money is primarily going to be uh, going to fund our pride celebration over the summer, uh, which is scheduled for August. Uh, in 2021, we had 300 attendees. Uh, in 2022, uh, nearly 700, so nearly doubled over the course of the year. Uh, we hope to keep that momentum going. I don't know that we're double it again. Um, but uh, this is the, the marquee event for the Pride Society. Uh, but in April, we had a community engagement event uh, at the Town Center Hotel. Oh, that's so, you always want to call it the coast. Um, uh, with nearly 70 attendees. Uh, so there's a lot of energy in the community uh, for more engagement, uh, more events for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so it really all starts with uh, with this funding and with the Pride Festival uh, that takes place in August. Uh, so part of that's, that's truthfully, I'm just really here to ask you to consider it uh, and answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Uh, Director Dan. You know, nice to see you again. I came to your annual general meeting at yes. the old courthouse there, and I just mm -hmm. I know you were talking at that annual general meeting about doing the celebration and a little bit more. Yeah, why you, why you chose that particular time? And what you to do. Yeah, for sure. So, like, kind of internationally, June is thought of as as the kind of official season, uh, but. Uh, for instance, in Vancouver, it happens in August and uh, uh, over the long weekend. Uh, I think that's often just because a lot of Pride events don't want to compete with other regional Pride events. Um, and, and that's certainly true of us as well. Uh, we wouldn't want to do it in the same weekend as Vancouver because, of course, lots of the community would be traveling then. Um, also, um, it was a... Um, yes, I, I might have to go back to the... Uh, meeting notes and, and see what the, the final decision was on, on why it was moved in August, but um, So August what? Uh, August oh my goodness, this um, the, the weekend after the long weekend I joined the board last week <laughs> um, so yeah, it's the long weekends of the seventh. So I believe it's the the nineteenth. Which Friday is Black Week? <laughs> yeah, it's well, certainly not the same day as that. Uh, but we were thinking of trying to capitalize on kind of the the energy from that and doing it closely afterward. Um, sure. Uh, just curious how much you're asking for and what it will be. Yeah, so the funding is there was two grants we applied to the city of Vancouver as well. I, I believe it was for 5,800 each. Um, so that's largely going to go to uh talent and insurance. The insurance is uh, I think $1,400, so that alone would be 10% of the total ask between the two grants, uh, and then hiring talent for the event itself, uh, which we expect to be $1,500, uh, and then the rest to uh, promotion, marketing, uh, and other organizational costs. It is effectively our annual budget that the, the two grants between them. Um, we have a small fundraising event happening in June as well, where we hope to uh, capture some more uh, funds by donation. Um, but again, uh, this is the primary source of funding for the society at this point. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Uh, just a follow-up question to the budget. Um, I see you've got a new line item, 2023-28 planning. So yes. $3,000, that's a significant cost for your group. Is that a new? Yeah, so I, I, my understanding, and I will have to speak with John uh, for clarification, because he was the one who drew up the budget, um, that we plan to do a similar outreach event this year, the uh, next year for the subsequent year. This year's event cost uh, $3,000 to three thousand dollars for the venue or the facilitator uh, and then other okay, so that's planning for the event not planning overall like strategic plan yes let me talk to john. and i know you're yeah, yeah let me talk to john about that before it's i just like i say it's a new line item so it's it's a significant amount. yes i agree uh yeah i'll, I'll talk to john sure. and uh feel free to see, see me on i'll see see him okay <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, said it was your request to the that regional district is fifty eight hundred, and then you mentioned there was also a request to you said city of Vancouver. Did you did you say city? city? Did I say oh, city? City? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've just been here, but I just moved back a few years ago. I guess old. I haven't said her. Um, yes, city of Pal River. Uh, that grant was approved. Um, so that that's great news for us. Um, but yes, hopefully um, we will approve our additional request. All right, thank you so much. Any other questions? That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you all for graciously accommodating me. <laughs> Have a great day. So that comes to the end of our delegations today. That brings us to no unfinished business. It brings us to a uh, question period. Do so you have questions from anybody here in the gallery? Questions from the press? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Glinsky from the Peak here. I had a couple of questions uh, through the Chair, probably through to the Manager of Financial Services. I'm wondering what funds are available in the grants and aid. Uh, yes, please, uh, Chair. Uh, Manager of Financial Services. Green engine. <laughs> You're not mute. Yeah. Keep working. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Um, I actually do have Jason Cowanhoven in attendance in the boardroom, and um, if I could direct that question to him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you the chair. I, I apologize. I was not prepared for that question. <laughs> <laughs> between um, grants and aid and social planning and economic development is uh, $358,000. Some of that funding is already allocated through, um, through um, agreements that have already been approved by the board, but, um, but that's the total budget is, like I said, $358,000. That is $115,000 in the social planning fund, uh, $40,000 in economic development, and 203,000 in the uh, grants and aid. I thank the manager for the detailed response. Uh, does the manager have any idea through the chair of the total ask for the grants and aid this year? The total ask, um, I don't have that in front of me, I'm sorry. That will be, um, that will be presented at the June 7th Finance Committee meeting. That's we'll show you the total ask and then um, what we're recommending for for funding. I appreciate that response, Chair. Um, so um, my presumption is then at the next Finance Committee meeting there will be contemplation of the uh, various applications. Uh, that will be the forum that the decisions will be made and passed along to the board. Am I correct in that, uh, Chair? Um, so process-wise, I think uh, our CAO, our acting CAO. Yes, thank you. That's going to be contemplated at the next mm -hmm. for, for Wednesday. Did you hear that? No, uh, Chair, sorry, I, I didn't hear the response. She said yes, that would be on the agenda for the first week Wednesday in June. So, I appreciate that. Those are my questions, Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity. 
Thank you, Mr. Galinsky. Any other questions from, I guess there is from So that's it. I would contemplate a motion for adjournment. You don't need one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new deal. So powerful. You have to adjourn all by except meeting adjourned. <laughs>